Hi, everybody. This is Michelangelo Badio. This is the first live stream, live multi-stream of this year. I'm very happy to be here. We've been doing this show almost two years now, and uh, I love every second of it uh, as much today as when we first started it. Now, the premise of this lesson is practicing neoclassical riffs. Uh, neoclassical style guitar just never seems to go out of fashion. It's kind of like saying Bach goes out of style. Uh, it, you know, the music is still really great. And so I'm going to show you some exercises that I use uh, to get these kinds of sounds and to be able to play at the speed you're going to need to play to play neoclassical death riffs. Now, um, before we start, I want to do a few shout outs. Uh, some of the usual people that always tune in. I see Denny here. Hey, JD, how are you? Uh, let's see. It's there's Tanya, Alexis. I saw Denny online. Uh, Brett, Nick, Roxana, uh, Sasha, and the list goes on. Let's see who else. Caesars there, Roberto. Uh, so there's a lot of people online. Um, Olaf. Hey, how are you? Cool. Uh, hey, Nick. It's good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everybody. Now, I am playing the Sawtooth Heritage Series 24 fret FRX guitar. This is a Floyd Rose system that the cool thing about it is you don't have to drill through the body. Um, it is a really great Floyd Rose system. I've used this uh, numerous times when you saw me jam with Adam last year, one of the last lessons that we did. In fact, I think it was. Hey, hello from Nashville, Gary. So a lot of people on my so anyway, using this guitar, the thing that I love about it is the the scale length is a, the frets are a little smaller. The the length is a little shorter, more like uh, it's like a I think it's a twenty four and three quarters versus say the shred scale length that's a little longer. And I have big fingers, but I love the reach. Just going like this. When I did my original Starlix video and used BC Rich guitars, they don't even make that model anymore, they use that smaller scale length. So this is not something that's new. What became newer is the larger scale length, the, the more shred style uh, scale. I love this. Joey's pumped. I'm the star of this show. No, you're not. So anyway, I'm trying to keep Joey contained a little bit, but it never works. And Robert is always angry. It's kind of like when you saw the Avengers, the first Avengers, and Bruce Banner goes, you know what my secret is? I'm always angry. Robert's always angry. He never says anything because he's got a pick in his mouth. But he just waits to shred. <laughs> Now, getting to neoclassical, because Joey and Robert are going off here. They feel pretty good today. So, well, they always feel good. And, uh, but one of the things that you, you know, I've talked about neoclassical music before, but one of the most important things is to first understand the scale that it's in. And I have talked about this, that it is the harmonic minor that... <laughs> That is really one of the focuses, you know, when you hear, like no boundaries, just this part. You can hear like.
So when you hear that, it just evokes this feeling. It's that got that sound. And so, and that's the sound you want. I mean, it sounds like Ingve, darn it. But I would not say darn it in, well, okay, damn it. Sounds like Ingve, damn it. We could say damn it. So, but it does. And Ingve sounds like Bach. And Bach sounded like Bach. So before him, he wrote, but when you hear the sound, embellish things that is basically the scale for neoclassical music now what Ingve did too he popularized something that was really cool in rock and you know I, I love him I saw his very first concert and you know even though I had been around actually a couple of years before him and so my career started literally two years before he came to America on shrapnel records same label that Ingve sign, was signed to but one of the things that he did that I really liked is if you take a harmonic minor scale, and then I'll show you some of the exercises. Now, what exactly is this? Music is a numbers game. That's why it works perfectly with computers. That's, we can actually use numbers to evoke feeling in music. There's just no other form of communication like this. I mean, you know, it, like a... This sounds kind of funny, but yesterday I was listening to the song, like, all the leaves are gone, and the sky is gray. I, I listened to California Dreamin' and all these, you know, harmony on such a winter's day. You know, they were using major sevenths. I mean, the harmonies are so beautiful, and it's a really sad song. But it gives you, it, it like, it gives me a lot of emotions when I hear this song. It's one of my favorite songs ever. But California Dreamin', when you hear the the emotion behind it, you know, he said, I stopped into a church along the way. And supposedly, the song was written about a guy that was dreaming about California that had to go off to war. Now, I don't know if that's true or not because the lyrics don't reflect that. But I was reading some of the comments and people were saying that it makes them sad and happy at the same time. And it's one of these songs that gives you this feeling that it's just, it evokes emotions. And it puts people back in the 60s if they were old enough. I mean, I'm older, but I'm not quite that old to, to have known California like that. I was still a little kid. And, and uh, but the same, in the Baroque era of music, neoclassical, they had something called unity of affection. That's A-F-F-E-C-T-I-O-N. And what that meant is the atmosphere, the feeling of the music from start to finish was unified, was... was In other words, the music sounded the same from beginning to end. But then that's when the classic era came in with Mozart. Afterwards, their idea was change, constant change. And see, it's the pendulum swing. So you can apply this to modern music too, where, where you had, for example, in the 1970s, the prog rock era, the era of the 70s style bands that eventually turned into the dream theater style. So you had these bands that would do, you know, Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, Jethro Tull. Yes, they would do these 10 minute epics and it was really complicated and really sophisticated. And what happened right after that? Punk, punk music. Because <laughs> they were a bunch of punks playing it. They were, it was simplicity, you know. I am the right. You know, and they would start singing or, you know, or Elvis Costello or, um, you know, in other words, it was this very simplified, stripped down form of music. I mean, when you think of the 80s, you know, that the guitar playing, the incredible amount of money, you know, that Guns N' Roses generated and the White Snakes, And then what happened? Grunge, the exact opposite, flannel shirts, down playing everything, kind of the angst like... 
I grew up like in a seven hundred thousand dollar home, but like I'm depressed because my parents didn't like get me a Mercedes Benz. I wanted the Benz. No, they just they thought I would be better with the Ferrari. Now I like to drive fast because I smoke a lot of weed. I was just getting the Mercedes because like safe. Then I'm thinking like it could be a Volvo, but I don't like Volvos. I want a Mercedes. And so you know you have this angst with this generation of kids that are, you know we're like suburban middle class. Like oh life sucks, it sucks. In, his, in, in your million-dollar house. But the point was, it's always the pendulum swings. Now, here's what I did. On the Speed Kill series, now, I, I have been with Metal Method a long time. I have 13 instructional programs. We have a two-day sale on the Speed Kills uh, series, and I show a lot of neoclassical riffs here. Now, there is something... <laughs> I showed what's called an etude. An etude is kind of it's a musical, uh, it's a musical piece, but it's shorter and it's more based for uh, instructional purposes. Like you know, Beethoven's Fifth is not an etude. Uh, it's a very short piece. And so what I did is I wrote this. I'll play it slow for you, and then I'll play. <laughs> So this is an etude that I wrote for Speed Kills. And what it does is it, it shows you, and it's not alternate picking. It is There's hammers and pulls. It's more legato style, but it's a really great exercise. And it's very musical because you start in A minor. Then you go to the dominant chord, E7. And I played it really fast on Speed Kills. And, you know, some people, you know, I talk a lot during the live streams, but if you want just really laser-guided lessons, get metal method because I, I there's no talking in between other than trying to explain what I'm doing. And, I've, and if people, you've seen me long enough, I'm very good at taking big concepts and and kind of sometimes where, where it's confusing and try to make it simple, you know, organize it into a quick sound bite. You know, a, a lot of times a teacher will say, well, I want to show you how to play fast and I'm going to do this. But I came up with, I'm going to give you the keys to the Lamborghini kind of sums it all up and so but when you play neoclassical music let's start from first harmonic minor scale <laughs> what is that music is a numbers game so you get this one two flat at three four five Flat at sixth, natural seventh, octave. And it's all based on when we say flat sharps, we base it on the major scale. Now, for many of you who know basic music theory or music theory at all, that it is it was once a mode. This was called the Ionian mode. But one of the things that made it so universal is the fact that it resolves. See that five, the, when you have a proper dominant five chord, it's just screaming to go back to. So that's really, now again, a lot of things have changed with the way people perceive music theory now. I studied classical harmony in college, and one of the things that differentiated modes from scales was that it resolved. See, if you take, for example, a Dorian mode, yeah. that's right, the five chord is minor, does that sound like it wants to go back to, not really, I mean, you can make it work, but if I go, wants to go. It's that dominant chord on the fifth note that makes the scale a scale. 
And nowadays, things are a little convoluted, but that's the way I understood it, and that's the way I like to think about it. So the major scale that was once a mode, really, why? Because... Very easy to understand, and, and it resolves. That five chord screams. Now then there's a thing in music called a deceptive cadence. Watch this. See, where it deceives you, it goes to the minor. It's called the relative minor of that major scale. Now, you don't know have to, have to know all this, but what you have to know is one thing. When I use the numbers, and when anybody uses a number saying one, two, flatted three, they are meaning take a major scale, go to the third degree, and move it down a fret, move it down a half step. So here's your harmonic mark. What Ingve did, and this is what I was talking about, is he started on the fifth scale, but played in a harmonic minor and so it goes. So when you hear this, is you play an A harmonic minor scale starting on the fifth scale degree. Now, in music, we call that the Phrygian dominant or the Spanish Phrygian mode, and uh, it works great. And see, the beauty about this whole concept of knowing scales modes is that one is all, one is many. For example, that major scale can contain all the modes. The Ionian mode. So you have, you have major, you have the Dorian minor, you have the Phrygian, you have the Lydian, you have the Mixolydian, and they're all based on the same notes. It's what starts and ends. That's what determines the sound. So if I, I go like this. Sounds like A minor, but if I go like this. And Ingve loves to end on that note. You hear it a million times on every album. And so what I did was... I compose songs, but not quite in the Ingve style. But the idea is the sound. And the reason why I was singing about feelings, you know, the song California Dreamin' or unity of affection is that trust your ear. Your ear will tell you what sounds good. Music theory is an attempt to explain why something sounds good. But you use your ear first. And so when you hear something... You know, just uh, uh, like a. You know, it just has a feel to it. And, and it's, you know, most people, there are people in this world that actually cannot feel music. And that's an interesting thing because when I hear songs that I really like, like California Dreamin', uh, it's not my generation, but I just love that song. It's just, the, and the harmonies, are, it's just amazing. And so, and there's a thing we call antiphonal. And you don't have to know all these words, but like they go, all the trees are brown, and, or all the leaves are brown. And then the other two, the, the female singer goes, goes, all the leaves are brown. And so it's called antiphonal. 
And so you have like a question and an answer. So all the leaves are, all the leaves are brown, and the sky is gray, and the sky is gray. And so you have this question answer throughout this whole song. It's like a dictionary of cool music theory things. And uh, that's why, I, but that's not the reason I like it. I just get a feeling. But music is about a feeling. Neoclassical is about a feeling. When you hear this. <laughs> Get that feeling of that classical sound and it's an etude and it's on speed kills so on metal method speed kill series is on sale and uh now one of the things that you have to do too and i've talked about this before let's see if there's some people online Bag paganini's fifth caprice that's right you should join wasp uh somebody said i should join wasp why because i look like i should be in wasp you know wasp was the first band i saw in l.a I got to digress here. I got to change subjects because this blew my mind. Okay, I moved to L.A. I'm in my 20s, a young guy. You know, not even mid-20s yet. And I look like a guy calling insurance in. You look like a nerd. See, Joey wasn't around. He was there. But he was he hadn't entered my head yet. So Joey was there. Robert was always there, you know, because he's, he's, I've never, I never heard you talk yet. <laughs> and so, but Joey's got a big mouth. And so um, what happened was, here's me. I look like a nerd that just came out of college. Not that people that go to college look like nerds, but I had really long hair. You've seen pictures of me when I was younger. I posted them online. But when I went to college, I was like, I've got ears. And so what I did was I cut my hair real short. I grew a mustache, so I definitely look like a terrorist. And I dressed really preppy really just like a like a college kid and, and so I get out of school and I'm home I'm still living at my parents house and I end up joining people that played in the band Santana they saw me play in Chicago I move out to California I look like I had I absolutely look so on rock I looked more rock and roll before college I was totally rocked I really long hair and then I go so the first place I go to when I'm in L.A. to see a band is the Troubadour. It's on Santa Monica Boulevard and, and real close to Doheny. And so what do I see? I don't even know who the band is. The place is packed with just these people. The audience look like, am I in Halloween, dude? Like, tell me, is this like October 31st, bro? Because I ain't never seen people like this before. So I see this. I'm in this audience, and I'm like, yes, I'm dressed up as a nerd. Pretty good costume. I'm really a rocker, but I look like a nerd. And so I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, the, the this logo shoots into flames, and I see this guy with hair down to here, with uh, having two members of the band in front of him on all fours with dog leashes on, and he's got like he's literally walking them like dogs, throwing raw meat into the crowd. I'm like. That's the first band I see in L.A. It happened to be a band called Wasp. And so I saw Wasp for the first time. I was like, oh, my God. And here's kind of what happened. In fact, this is exactly what happened. I moved to California in February. I didn't see my parents much that year. Uh, I went home in the summertime for a couple of days, and then I went back for Christmas. So from February to December, I basically lived in L.A., you know, 24-7, except for a few days. I started off looking like a nerd. By the time I went home at the at the end of the year, my hair was long, dyed jet black. I had earrings and tattoos. And my parents, I didn't even realize it. I come home for Christmas. My, my dad is like, what happened to you, son? My mom's like, oh, my God. Are you on drugs? <laughs> you know, first thing, are you okay? And and like, no, I'm not on drugs. I'm naturally high. And so, but I went home. I, I looked like a rock star, and I didn't even realize it. I had no idea because the people in L.A. at that time just looked a certain way. And I, I just happened to be with these people, and I became what I was, my environment was. And the reason I'm saying this, it's the same in life. It's the same on guitar. If you want to study a neoclassical style, if you want to learn a style, 
learn the style and get into it. Get you know own that style. And and a lot of times if you practice, just if you practice the song No Boundaries. got that sound so you start to become one with this and that's where that unity of affection the idea of feeling from beginning to end there's feelings to everything the way a person looks the way they present themselves musically visually and i love that phrygian sounds like i'm pumped So anyway, one of the exercises is that you can play that you can play is this etude from Speed Kills. Another one, arpeggios. I've gone over this before, but listen to the sound. Just three three string arpeggios. gives you that sound. Now, I wrote a song called The Finish Line, which is, uh, we call it the neoclassical zone. And one of my favorite parts of it, and I actually didn't play the finish line for a long time live, but I love this one part that I included in the intro to my song Rainforest, and it went like this. One more time. And then I went back into... And the reason I bring up my song Rainforce, Phrygian Dominance. And I went. Then I used an A minor harmonic. I used an A harmonic minor scale there. And then in the song, I started using like, uh, like the chorus part. Okay, somebody, let's see. Oh, somebody, I'm just reading some of the comments here. There's so many. But anyway, when you focus on what you're supposed to do, if you think about neoclassical music, this is one of the things, and again, it's a life lesson. Um, everything that, to me, relates to guitar relates to life. Uh, you know, my life is music. So, And I, I was very fortunate that when I was 10 years old, I started playing the guitar. But when I was five, I played keyboards. And so I had a background in piano before I ever played guitar. But I realized that the music I liked was guitar driven, especially, I mean, you're a little kid here. Like, you know, you're, you hear this distortion stuff, or you hear the Beatles, you know, which wasn't really that heavy of a band, especially nowadays. Uh, but, you know, even early Judas Priest. I mean, it's just mean sounding, and it's nowhere near as heavy as music that's written today with seven string, eight string guitars. With an eight string guitar, you don't need bass, dude, because the eight string is the bass. Meshuggah doesn't have very loud bass. I remember I did my Metallica medley. And somebody goes, 
They wrote a comment. They go, it doesn't sound like Metallica. And I'm thinking, why? And he goes, you can hear the bass in my version. I'm like, ooh, that's a cut. But, you know, Jason knew that it's true. You know, that album with uh, Blacken down there and, uh, you know, I, you really couldn't hear the bass. But, you know, that's what happens in a lot of super heavy music. But again, each style of music, each genre has a feeling. And one of the things that, that I love uh, about music, and especially even now, I think this youngest generation of guitar players is just insane, insane. But we were insane growing up too. But, in every, but I didn't have the luxury growing up. Uh, for example, I want to learn Michelangelo Badio's picking technique. Type in my name, a thousand videos come up, and you can watch my picking technique up close. I could never do that with my heroes growing up because that technology didn't exist. So we had a guess. Well, there's no more guesswork. Guitarists of today can analyze this on the spot, real time, and say, okay, well, this is how they do it. And, and uh, somebody wrote, I love Michael, but Mashuga has plenty of bass. Yes, they do, but it's bass in the guitar. Those are eight strings. And so, yeah, you hear low end, you hear kick drum, but the bass is not pronounced. Do you think the bass on Meshuga is as loud as, say, an R&B album? Listen to McCartney. Listen to the Beatles. Listen to the song, uh, let's see, uh, uh, what's that one song that's just got this ridiculous, Dear Prudence. You know, it goes... And and McCarthy, do 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 do. It's really loud in the mix. The, you you used to hear a lot of bass in pop songs and mixes of the past in analog recordings. In digital, you don't really have to. I'm not. I love Mashuga. You know, I think they're great. But I'm saying, you know, relatively speaking, when you have eight strings, and it's that low, you are encroaching in bass frequencies. When I studied orchestral music, you have to learn the ranges of these instruments because a French horn is limited. It's got an octave and a fifth range. A violin is high. A viola is lower. Then a cello is lower than that. A bass is lower than that. But see, in an eight-string guitar, you are basically got viola to bass, and you've even got some violin registers. So instead of the separation of the frequencies, you have all these frequencies. So you can't tell me that if you're playing in the bass register and a bass is playing in your register, how is the bass going to completely overdo what you're doing? You are in their domain. And that's what I'm saying. What's hap what's, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's what it is. And so that's what I mean. All right. Anyway, let's, uh, yeah, Justice for All. That's, you know, some, my, I have engineers that love that album mix. I go, and I love Metallica to death. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's a good mix. I'm like, ah, Joey's like, wow, that's a good mix. You know, and, and Robert's like, he won't say anything because he just wants to shred. But uh, anyway, so I, I saw that question come in. Come in. Uh, enough's Enough version of Dear Prudence is so awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, I know Enough's Enough really well. They're from my hometown of Chicago. Chips Enough is a really great bass player, great singer. I mean, there's a reason that they had hit songs you know, so that good. Okay, um, getting back to this. Now, I want to show you a little bit about the guitar. I've talked a lot about theory today, but I figured why not? Good way to start the year because everybody's had the Christmas holidays, probably nuked a few brain cells along the way. So I thought, what better way to get back into it than to hit you some words you got to, like, think about, man? You know, I, I used to, we used to, um, one of the things that I, I've known, and I've said this before, is being a good teacher is not showing the students how smart they are. Being a good teacher is teaching you something. So, you know, I, I know how to use a lot of words. I mean, I could say, hey, yes, I'm, and I'm including color pointillism in the strato and the counterpoint. It's like, what? And so color pointillism is a, color pointillism is a very interesting concept. If I went like this... Uh, the, each color meaning different tones of instruments and points meaning a different color takes a different point. So I can go like there's that song Painted Black by the song. I've seen a red door and I want it painted black. 
we applied colored pointillism to that song. It was my idea when I was in my early 20s in a band in Chicago. I had We had four singers, four guys in the band. Everybody could sing. So I, had, I went, I've, then the next person seen, next person, uh, red and we i've seen a red door and i want to paint it black and then we had this background paint it black but we couldn't do it with the pointillism but that was color pointillism where everybody takes a point and and the color of their voices each takes a point so we had four singers so i've seen a red door and i want it painted black so we just rotated until the phrase ended that is color pointillism um do you need to know that stuff no but i know it so why not say it but i figured for the first time today this year say some stuff to blow your mind now let's get back to this bad boy this is a floyd frx It is mean. Now, one thing I love about these live streams is I'm dressed like I could go to the gym, and I probably will. Uh, so, and because uh, I don't want to overdress for this, we are in lessons. I'm not trying to show you the fashion statement, but look at that trim. That trim is bad. It is made by Floyd Rose. I I loved it because I like detail on guitars. And, you know, I mean, I've designed a lot, a lot of guitars in my life. And the thing that I love about Sawtooth is we're setting these, like, quiet trends here. For example, nobody was using matted finishes a couple of years ago. Everybody was doing, like, these kind of Kiesel-style guitars with a really nice wood grain. We said, yeah, that's great, but we want to do something mean. So we started using satin finishes, which means flat black, flat white. And all of a sudden, it's a trend. And I'm not saying we started it, but in many ways we did. And, and uh, now, um, you know, there's other companies. We have the GoDPS Live uh, app. There is another big company that has their live app. And uh, what we try to do at Sawtooth is just think outside the box. Um, not many guitar companies use this FRX because it's hard to explain. This is not quite like a locking trim, but it is a locking trim. First of all, you don't drill, whoops, excuse me. You don't drill through the guitar body. You only drill here. But, you know, people have asked me, well, dude, man, that looks like, like, uh, whoa, dude, like maybe I could put that on my guitar, dude. Well, I don't, if you want, you can, but I don't really recommend taking a guitar and just drilling into it. You can get one like this that's already finished. It is also, it's 24 frets, not 22. So you have 24 frets of death, doom, and destruction. Joey approves. And so, and it's that smaller scaling that you would expect on a guitar with the shape. So you get this, but this Floyd FRX is really cool because it's locking. Instead of springs, you have this device here. So on the back of a guitar, if you had to adjust the springs, you'd have to take a screwdriver and take those two whole two screws and adjust the tension of the, of the springs. Well, here, that's right here. And there's all these really cool little micro adjustments. This is almost like a, a more temperamental regular Floyd Rose. You get this. You know, you can get all those. So you get that basic vibrato sound. But you can also do dive bombs and do. See how perfectly in tune that is? This system works amazing. It's a little more nuanced than a regular Floyd Rose. Like, to play Pantera all the time and do Dimebag. Yeah, you can do that, but it's not really quite made for that. It's a little more nuanced, but it has... And it still comes back in perfect tune, and I love it. I really love this guitar. Uh, I love there's and people say, well, dude, man, you can't get like with a big cutaway, you know, like there's a lot of stuff here before the 24th fret. Well, yeah, I have a big hand. Look. 
Sorry, I hit the tuner, which which cuts off everything. But it's so easy to access this because this cutaway literally comes at the 23rd fret. <laughs> so there's only one more fret left to go. So you can... Look. Look. You know what? I'm wearing this. You're going to laugh. I'm wearing slippers here. And I had a lot of stuff going on before this live stream. And the inside of the slippers got these little things. And I'm hitting my switch, but it's going between the slipper, the, the soles of the shoe. So it's, there we go. Turn on, you jerk. So what? It's really easy. Somebody asked, does it work? like a Floyd Rose. Yes, in fact. Like. Now, also, one thing that's really cool about this, you can set this up to be a, what's called a positive stop. In other words, it locks, so you can't bring it up any higher. Uh, somebody says, explain no boundary song. I explain it. Let's see, for five boundaries. Yeah, you can get this. You can get a great dive bomb. And listen to how intuitive it is. It's still perfectly in tune after I beat the heck out of it. Yeah, somebody wrote, it stops before you go too far. That's exactly what a positive stop is. But you can actually adjust it. There are more fine-tuning adjustments on this than there is on a regular Floyd. And that's what makes the key difference. Plus, you don't drill into the guitar. And somebody said this looks like an anchor. It's one cool-looking anchor. I think this looks bad. You know, I used to love the old Bigsby tremolos on guitars because they were just beefy, or like the old SGs with that, with when, when they had the wang bar and they had the big piece. I like detail on guitar. And uh, somebody said, play Eruption. I actually played that recently, and I did a Van Halen medley that I show that. Uh, you know, Eruption's actually not that hard. I mean, come on. <laughs> Now, this guitar is tuned to concert pitch. Eddie tuned down a half step. So when I do uh, Eruption, you know, and then I play it, I have a Van Halen medley. It's all down a half step. You can actually watch. Uh, okay, let's see. You said, tell me more Michael adjustments. So somebody's sitting there. Okay. Okay. But anyway, getting back to the Floyd FRX, I'm reading some of the comments. They're great. And yeah, and Denny uh, writes, no routing means more wood for more tone, which is exactly true. Uh, when you have a regular Floyd Rose, they literally route out this huge chunk of wood right through the body. And so, you know, they, the Floyd actually looks kind of like this, where the guitar's here. Floyd mechanism goes down, springs, and so you have a lot more wood on the guitar. This is a real beefy sounding instrument. Let me move this pedal board back here. But Just thick. I love that sound. That And so you get this great tone, but these nuances on this FRX are really incredible. Uh, there's, there's an adjustment here. There's an adjustment here. There's micro adjustments. So you can really get it to feel the way you want. It's a more nuanced and a more, more micro adjustment 
uh, oriented trim than the regular Floyd roses. And it works like a Floyd Rose. You can beat the heck out of it. And uh, some East Freely for fun. No. <laughs> I love Kiss. But I don't even know many Kiss songs. I jammed with them before. But you know what we did when I jammed with them? Gene actually started it off in E. And I was it, I had not moved to L.A. yet. So I was still in my early 20s. <laughs> And uh, he was during the Vinnie Vincent uh, era when uh, they got actually Vinnie Vincent. It was right, right around Lick It Up. And uh, I remember he starts and I'm thinking to myself, that song's not in E, it's in D. But it's Gene Simmons. And he will stick his tongue out at me if I don't play what he wants me to play. So he starts it in E instead of D. And that's what, what I did. And I heard, I'm with you, my love. And all of a sudden, the evil gene. He's like, I'm with you, my love. And then the part where it goes, I've been waiting so long to be where I'm going. And see when you go, to be where I'm going. The harm is, to be where I'm going. And so Paul Stanley comes in, and I'm hearing, Paul Stanley standing here, Gene Simmons here, I'm in the middle, Eric Carr behind me, I'm like, yes, that was our guest, yes, 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 I'm playing less, like, yes, and then Gene said, you know, so I'm a, and then I, I started doing that, <laughs> that's a whole other story, and then I showed Gene how to play over the neck, uh, but getting back to this bad boy. It's a great sound. And so my slipper doesn't want to open up this too. And if you want. So you have this great trem on this guitar. And I personally love locking trems. Now, they're not for everybody, but to change strings is really easy. This FRX is really awesome. And uh, a lot of people just don't understand it, so they might write it off uh, or say this and that. But once you just realize that you have so many, it's kind of like an Android versus an iPhone in many ways. Um, iPhones are easy. If you know an iPhone, you know an iPad. If you know an iPhone, you, you basically get a, a basic feel for a Mac, whereas an Android phone is more nuanced. Uh, you know, you can, you can set it and adjust it for unique, uh, for your uniqueness. You can set the parameters in some ways, more ways than, than an iPhone. And the point is that this is like that, that there's so many different nuances that you can do. But the bottom line is once you set it, Set it and forget it because it's going to stay in tune and it's going to be great. Um, now, I hope you got something out of this. I'm going to recap. Um, Metal Method has a two-day sale on the Speed Kill series. What you saw in that uh, etude is one of the exercises there. It's really great. If you want in-depth, just strictly focusing on lessons, get Metal Method. I mean, because here, this is a show. So I get to teach you, but I get to impart the world according to Mikey because in my world... The guitar is just part of the way I live. You know, it's a, it's a lifestyle. Playing, to me, is is just an extension of the way I think in real life. And, and so, and, and I'm living proof. I mean, I've been doing this my whole life. My fingers feel great. I don't have hand problems. I busted my hand when I was a kid. I've had lights fall on me. I have a big, huge V-shaped scar. When I was playing over the neck like this, a light fell down from the lighting truss and clipped my hand. I was like, I went like this to try and block it. 
it I have this killer scar and it was bleeding like I was in a Slayer concert, dude. And so it's like blood's gushing down, but I refuse to stop the show. I'm like, I am metal. Metal will not stop. Metal does not compromise. Blood, I don't care. Blood is dripping down my arm. It's just, I, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a serious, serious V-scar. Because literally, I was like, ah! And the lights just went and sliced my skin in a V-shape, pulling it back. And I never got stitches because, why? Because I'm metal. I don't need stitches. If I want stitches, I'll staple my hand shut myself. And so, but what I did was, I just played the show, and people came up, and I was opening up, believe it or not, for a quiet riot that day, that night, and people came off uh, when I got off. She was like, dude, man, that was raw, dude, raw, dude. It looked like, I swear, it looked like real blood, dude. I'm like, because it was. And, uh, you know, people thought it was part of the show that I, you know, but, I mean, when this light fell, I literally went, I was, like, in doing this, and I went like that, and I was like, ah! This hurts, but I didn't stop the show. And so the point is this, metal is. It, metal is. It is. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, my amps go to 11. Why? Well, that's one more than 10. Why? Well, why not? 11. And so I'm, I'm very black and white about things. I'm very clear cut. If I want to practice something that's neoclassical, I practice neoclassical. Um, if you focus on what you want to do, you can do it, you know, and that, but also too, what makes a great guitar player is that you don't do the same things all the time. But my Speed Kill series, I, like I said, I have 13 instructional programs through Metal Method. They're all great. The production's great, the, you know, animated tab, all sorts of things. But it focuses on what you're supposed to learn. Um, you know, people ask me, well, what do you practice if you don't have a guitar? I don't practice guitar. For, I, don't, I don't believe in like the bizarre finger exercise. You know, I mean, how do you practice football if you don't got a football? You know, how do you practice baseball if you don't got a bat and a ball? I can think about it. Dude, I just hit a home run in my head, bro. It was awesome. Dude, it was like a grand slam, dude. They were like, bases loaded, dude. Yeah, but what happened? I don't know, dude, but it just went over. It was like Wrigley Field went over, like onto the street, bro. It was like massive. But it's in your head, dude. Don't matter. It's real to me. And so, you know, that's kind of not the way I do it. Uh, I feel that if you want to practice guitar, pick up a guitar and practice it. And focus on something that you want to do. Uh, focus on, 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 be specific. You know, there's always a method to the madness. Like even having fun. I found over the years that when I'm in a good mood, and I'm not, a, like, I don't have a secondary personality. This is me, on stage, off stage. I might be a little more quiet off stage, but I like to be in a good mood when I play. And I'll give a lot of credit to the bands that I was with, Holland and Nitro. Jim Gillette is, is like a death machine. He knows 80,000 ways to kill you in 15 seconds. He's a black belt in all these different degrees of martial arts. But when we toured together, he said, it was so cool. We never, ever got into arguments because he was the same way. When you know, when you're that confident in your own ability and you're not, and you're humble about it, you're like, hey, man, he knows he can kill you. So he's not trying to kill you. You know, it's like he was, he was genuinely a nice person. And so when we were on tour, like the vibe in our tour bus was fun. It's like it was a very lighthearted. Before we went on stage, there were no big talks about, you have to do this for king country. You must play this way. If you make one mistake, we will deduct your wages. You know, it's not like you were under pressure. It was a really good vibe before we went on stage. And I found that's what I enjoy because there are certain people in life that like chaos. They, they are not comfortable with themselves, so they want to create chaotic situations. And not always because they're not comfortable with themselves. Some people thrive in chaos, and I've met plenty of those in my life. Um, I'm not like that. And so, but it's the same way when I practice, you know, it's not a chaotic environment. I first start off with the exercises, and I show these in Speak Hills. Then I start working on, like, what am I going to work on today? Um, I have drum programs that I've showed you. I start at 185, 190, 195, 2. I go up to 245 on 16th notes. That's really fast. And I, we did a survey, Doug Marks and I, from Metal Method, 
And we found a lot of people are really not much faster than 110 uh, playing 16ths. And I can attribute that one, you know, obviously you haven't practiced as much as I have or made it a career, but two, you've got to approach speed two different ways. One, slow to fast, but the other is crash and burn fast. So you wipe out just so you know the feeling of speed. I've got a feeling, a feeling deep inside for speed. You know, you play faster than you can just to feel it. And then you attack it from both ways. And pretty soon you find your center might be 110. It's going to move to 115, move to 120. You approach it in two ways, and that's what I talk about. But anyway, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for being here uh, this evening. Um, there's just a lot going on uh, in, in the Mikey world. So this lesson topic, hopefully it helps you. And, you know, working on the arpeggios, working on that etude is a really great etude for you to get started. Uh, I did the shout outs. Go DPS Music, part of the Sawtooth family we have a, we have an app go dps music live you can get discounts there are discounts on this guitar right now there's a discount on the metal method programs also one last thing uh, many of the guitars in the sawtooth line are righty and lefty we have a, the largest selection of left-handed instruments out of any guitar company different ones that's out there and so if you're lefty and you want to play lefty this is the company to go to um, but the one thing after the last thing that I was going to talk about, and then I'll stop it, is I was involved in a really great shred collab recently from a young guitarist named Jared Dines, who's, you know, big time on the Internet. And he did its shred collab Four. we got over one million views in 10 days. Uh, it's approaching 1.2 million now, and it's going to hit multi, multi millions. But there are some great young guitar players on there. I played my double. I defy anybody in 15 seconds to play right-handed perfectly clean, left-handed perfectly clean, and two guitars at the same time. In fact, the hardest thing it was for me to do is to throw the pick down and grab a new pick and so I could get positioned to play lefty. But I did this all in 15 seconds, and I'm only one of over two dozen guitar players. You owe it to yourself to check this out. It's the new, a lot of new players, uh, Matt from Trivium. Uh, there's just so, and it ends I think his name is Marson, that really great acoustic player that plays very percussively. Uh, he ends the shred clap. I was in the very beginning. So they put a lot of thought in who starts it, Jason Richardson. I was right in the beginning and who ends it. But, um, you know, just 2022 is shaping up to be an amazing year. Focus and you will do it. I'm Michelangelo Badio. I'm Joey! <laughs>